Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap. My name is Aaron, and this week I went to the NAMCON, or Nation of Makers, conference in Chattanooga. I have a series of five interviews for you. All are with very interesting people um, from the maker community around the United States, and I hope you enjoy them. All right, so um, who are you? Um, what space you're from, and uh, tell me a little about yourself. Well, I'm Joel Leonard. Uh, I uh, travel the country. I have a, uh, a, an effort now where I'm around the country called the Maker Happen Tours. Uh, I help found uh, several maker spaces and support a makers, the whole maker movement uh, all around the country and throughout the world. And uh, I've Several, I was the chairman of the National Defense Manufacturing Workforce Committee. I've been on a lifelong, or last 17 years, I've been on a mission to build the next generation of skilled technicians. And I built the, or helped build, the uh, makerspace in Greensboro, North Carolina, where we had called the Forge, that I named, because it used to be a blacksmith shop. Calling it a hacker space is so difficult to get the general community to buy in to support you. So we changed the name from the Greensboro Hacker Space to the Forge, Greensboro's Maker Space. And so by doing that, we were more palatable and we were able to get the community support. We got the mayor, we got the chamber, we got all these folks to get behind us and support what we do. So. Um, so in the first year, Aaron, we had 16 new companies were formed. Wow. Nine patents were filed. We brought in some heavy hitters that were needing some help to get some that technology put together, and we were able to uh, assemble some things quickly. And, um, and then we also hosted a series of events, including a job fair, um, in which a lot of people now think that maker fairs hosted job-related events they would have a stronger traction and, and still be in existence. So, um, so we're uh, we did that, and uh, so we we feel confident we can take credit for the people that got connected that got jobs. So we got a, at least 50 people jobs in the first year. Very nice. So now they got so much going on that, and, and the city's gotten behind it, and so many things occurred that that uh, they gave them a hundred thousand dollars last year, and they got a hundred thousand from matching grants. So. Uh, or matching funds from the community. So it's amazing. I'm so proud of a guy named Joe Rotundi who's done outstanding to build on what I've done and it's freed me up to know, go around, learn from all the different makers from around the country and see what they do and then encourage other folks to implement some of the strategies that we did and then also sprinkle the strategies that I'm seeing in other places and trying to sustain this movement. We got a lot of good hearted people. They're trying to do good things and they just need some guidance and I'm there to, to uh, help them out, so. So tell me a little about this thing here. What is that? So it's funny, uh, uh, when we were expanding our maker space, we were given uh, about 500 pounds of scrap metal from titanium ingots to copper and brass. Well, not copper, but brass and, and bronze. And, and uh, we were trying to figure out, we had maxed out, we started having to buy storage space for all the equipment. I, got, I hosted some big events for National Manufacturing Day and we started having tr tractor trailer loads of equipment just donated to us. And we needed some work with our met new metal shop so we got the uh, machine shop company called MSI. They gave us some of their uh, items that they were gonna dis dispose of. And uh, so I uh, was thinking, I was like, how do we, um, how do we get a splash in the summertime where people will give us money? And so I met a family that was fed up with their damn car in the driveway. The transmission of the Volvo was busted and it was more expensive to fix it. So they just uh, gave it to me as a tax write-off. And we uh, were like, man, let's do an old high school car smash <laughs> and do it during the 4th of July. And, uh, and so we... We were thinking that together and we were trying to figure it out. Like, you know, people will pay, pay a little bit for a sledgehammer, but they'll, if we can make a giant hammer, they may do something really, they're gonna pay us some big money. We ended up raising, we had a couple of events that summer and we were smashing watermelons on the news channel and at the weather report, we were, I mean, it was so funny. And, 
Um, but we actually got about five thousand dollars, and that helped wow. us get yeah, it helped us get the funding in order to get the uh, the new building that we moved into. So, um, so we. Uh, uh, after that, I didn't know what to do with it, and, and again, I got freed up. I was able to go around, and I was like, you know what? I need to take this hammer to assemblies. And this, if kids don't, if we want to get kids excited about working with tools, and, and you know, what better t- thing that they can, anybody can relate to, is a hammer. So I uh, started taking it on school tours and things, and I got assigned another project where I was brought in to help one of the uh, worst uh, schools in the, in the state of North Carolina, middle schools. They had uh, 2,000 uh, instrument, uh, incidents uh, for 600 kids. There's like three, three incidents a kid, just disciplinary issues. So they've created a makerspace there. I helped them set it up. Nice. And then I would bring in the hammer, and I had all these kids go nuts over this hammer. So, so when they asked me to go around the country and uh, help with the maker movement, so the, the last 15 months I literally have been on the road. Went 40, had to buy a new set of tires, and went 45,000 miles. Uh, went to, uh, 85 maker spaces. Been to 16 maker fairs. Have been to five maker conferences in the last 15 months. And so, <laughs> You've been all over. yeah, and so the depth and understanding I've got now is so much deeper than what it was before with the, just the experience of the mm-hmm. forge. And I just got to understand, there's some amazing, absolutely amazing folks out there. And I feel like I might get kicked out of living in the South, but New Jersey's Maker Depot is one of my favorite places. They're the ones who, I went up to New York and after Wool Maker Fair, they put me up. And then I went back up there a couple months ago, and I showed him the hammer. I said, man, I, I had this guy tell me this, this hammer's just a prop, and it need, doesn't do anything. I wish I could put some LEDs in it. And the guy, this kid, 20-year-old kid named uh, Bradley, uh, he, uh, oh, I can do that. <laughs> and he, uh, he said, yeah, that's no problem. I got all, and he showed me these discs that he had, and he said, yeah, I can put that in the hammerhead. I can put this in the handle. And I was like, cool. He says, can you get it done before NomCon, Nation of Maker Conference? And he said, yeah. He said, so y'all can bring it down. He said, yeah. <laughs> so last Monday, he, uh, I said, uh, are you going to be able to do it? I'm not sure. So you don't pick, tick me off. I then got on his Facebook page, found all my friends that are also his friends. And somehow or another, his mother-in-law had friend of me, and I didn't know it. <laughs> So I asked them, is, is this guy a high-integrity guy, or is he just somebody that's going to say something to, and not deliver? Mm-hmm. He really is letting me down if I don't have this thing. <laughs> so Tuesday night, he spent, and this other guy named Urbano, they worked together, and they knocked out, brought it here to the Nation of Maker Conference, the tricked-out version of this basic hammer, and they put 300 LEDs in this thing, and you can control it with your phone. The different I, colors. I wouldn't call it a basic camera. It's like a. Well, how, how, how heavy is the Thorminator? Well, now it's it, it's 50 pounds. But I mean, all it was was a hammer. Yeah, it's a 50 pound. Now it's a, <laughs> now it's. If kids don't get excited about a hammer, uh, uh, the then tools with this thing, I need to just you know t- drop them off at the morgue because they you can't do anything with them. I mean, they are not functional people. I mean. So anyway, yes. Yeah, so, so what I did in these 16 maker fairs, I literally challenged anybody. I didn't care how old they were. I didn't care how small they were. Uh, I challenged them to pick up the hammer. And I really didn't care if they couldn't do it. I cared that they didn't try. Right. Because we aren't building the struggle muscles. We aren't making this tool sexy. We aren't making them desirable. And then we wonder why people aren't able to pick up the skill sets and take on the jobs that my generation, you can't see me, but I got a beard <laughs> and I'm in my 50s. And, and we got way too many of my generation walking out the door and we got kids falling behind them that don't have the attitudes, aptitudes, or interest. And more importantly, the interest in doing uh, what we've been doing. And uh, so we're having a severe challenge. And again, with the unemployment being like at 2.9% in some communities, it's already a challenge. So a lot of these people that are un and underemployed, um, if they knew how to do things and work with their hands and work with machines in addition to working with their cell phone, they could do so much more. 
So, so it's very important for, the, for us to get kids to put down their dang cell phone and pick up a hammer <laughs> and start falling in love with working with tools. Exactly. So what do you love about NomCon, Nation of Makers Conference? Well, I love the Nation of Makers Conference because it's not a conference. It's a, it's a tribe. I feel like, uh, in fact, it's so funny with the, uh, the news hit that Na- Maker Media was going under. I woke up the next morning, and literally, I think I forecasted this event because I saw faces of people that are here. And I, uh, we were all in a hand on, holding each other's hands, and we were all saying, I belong. So you got all these people, all these disparate backgrounds, all these disparate interests, all working together to support each other to advance the maker movement. And so the Nation of Makers is uh, is literally, I feel like I got a family. I mean, I, I told you, I went around the country. I didn't spend any money in a hotel. I had people house me. I had people give me their keys to their house. I had people uh, feed me, all these things. Again, I'm the Johnny out hammer seed now, <laughs> planting hammers uh, all around, little seeds to get people interested in, in not growing uh, apples, but growing uh, the skill sets to advance our future. And, and so um, it's been such an honor to be able to serve and, and be connected in the nation of makers. And, uh, you know, we were in the White House and to now have the uh, whole, org- th- all these different people from Alaska and all over that are here. And again, people from New Jersey that I'm now feel family. You know, how many Southerners say that they got family in New Jersey? Not many that originally came from the South. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's been remarkable. I've been so impressed with the depth and detail, and it just gives you an encouragement that the future is very bright. But we got a lot that we lost. Uh, I lost a brother this week, and he's supposed to be here. It's on his way here. And he was a guy with me when we went around for the first three weeks of the Maker Appen Tours. He drove me friggin' crazy, but he damn was supposed to be here. And he's a guy that founded Make Nashville, and he was the most, he was like John Candy. Just, you could not keep this guy down. He was always jumping up, positive, happy, go lucky guy. And some idiot 23 year old kid killed him on the damn highway and and so uh so anyway with the loss of maker media and the loss of matt kennington um i'm at more i feel like i'm unchained and i'm getting ready to speak in three hours and that session if they it's going to be explosive because i'm just going to just put all the restraint and just throw it into the energy of getting things done and one of the things i want to emphasize before you let me go is we got to, as a society, start putting a renewed focus and energy in, uh, into converting our waste into, uh, into treasure. And just like this hammer. Now I got people bidding for this hammer. I got people begging me to give them a hammer. And it was all waste. It was all trash. We just put it together and made a new thing to it. And so we got to look at that. We got now countries don't want our shit. Excuse me. They don't want our trash. They want our. They want us uh, to buy their stuff. And so, wonder well, how are we giving them resources that we could turn into stuff we could sell to them. Mm-hmm. So we got a uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. There's 2.5 million dollars was spent in building a facility that put 15 people to work to study the different things that are going in a landfill and what can they do to commercialize it. What can we do to turn our our crap into treasure? We got to do that, and and so we can't ship it. We shouldn't burn it, and burying it's just delaying it, and um, and it's limiting the space. So, we've got to turn more trash to treasure. And maker spaces are an ideal. I mean, what better place when you got all these curious geniuses that are hanging out together, that that need extra income? We need to get them funding and to get them going to do this. And also, I want to mention that there's a guy here who's an engineer's engineer, so he's anti-marketing. He doesn't know how the hell to damn get his ideas uh, scaled up. But we got this guy that invented, Daniel Neer. I encourage you to interview him and get him to talk about his sensor that he invented in Birmingham, which they have high asthma rates. Uh, They got pollution all over the place. 
smog all over and he's uh, created these sensors these air quality sensors and it's a he's taken a Honeywell thing and he's juiced it up he's had all this different functionality inside of it and it'll actually text it does a spectro analysis it sucks in the air and it does a spectro analysis and tell you what the if you got a dirty bomb or if you're out in the middle of a remote area like in California and you got forest fire it'll tell you Nice. So you could build thousands of these and deploy them on rooftops all over the place, and then then and then somebody could be able to uh, have a grid. I can imagine a, a control thing where they're sitting there saying, "Hey, we got a pip here, we got a pip here." They could start taking that data and deploy resources to go out and fix it, yeah. and or tell people stay inside, or you know they could be able to if it's again dirty bomb type thing. They could they could really marshal some effort. So so we got to. Uh, um, that's just a maker. It's a guy just curious that wanted to do something. Mm-hmm. We got to get more of these people engaged, and we got to get his idea. We got to get other maker spaces to copy it and do it in their community. So, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for being on. Oh, my pleasure. Anything else you need, let me know. Sure. Let's make her happen. Mm-hmm. So, thanks for taking some time to, to meet with me today. Uh, you know, uh, maybe tell us know who you are and a little bit about yourself. So my name is Rachel Sad, and I'm from Oakland, California. I am the executive director at Ace Monster Toys Makerspace. Um, AMT is a nine-year-old makerspace, and uh, currently we have about 180 members and uh, serve approximately 1,100 people a year with uh, hundreds of tools in 3,200 square feet of Bay Area (laughs) space. (laughs) Um, So that's me. Okay. Uh, uh, What, what, I guess, what made you come to NOMCON? Um, I had an amazing experience last year, which is what got me to Tennessee this year. And um, really, what's attractive for me at NOMCON, kind of my favorite thing, is the conversations and the connections and hearing perspectives that I just don't have access to in my own geography. Um, And that is like, it it inspires me, it informs me, um, it disabuses me of notions that I might have been overly attached to. um, And uh, just, it allows for that kind of um, collaboration that happens when we're more than the sum of our parts when we come together to share our experiences and ideas so that's my favorite thing about NomCon. <laughs> so the hallway conversation <laughs> I'm here for the hallway conversation like what we're doing right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you brought the fat system which is the open access control system for makerspaces and I'm really excited about that because I've talked about my system on the show for a couple of times so Maybe, maybe uh, tell us a little bit about that and, and what you've done with that and reasonings behind it, maybe design decisions between using the, the Django app and stuff like that. So AMT, like many spaces, especially spaces that have a few years on them, has homebrew access systems. We've got one thing that somebody built ages ago on one door. We've got another thing on another door. We've got another thing on a laser. And we want to, con- we want to be able to either get metrics or control access um, as we've grown, because our needs have grown when it comes to this in our space. And we just kept hitting these roadblocks of repeatability, price accessibility, code accessibility, and how usable um, the outputs were for people who didn't necessarily code who couldn't do deep coding, but they were happy to volunteer to do the administrative processes. And like, what could we really do with it? And we were also looking to kind of further our community's ability to do things from the bottom up. Like, why not have the door system or the tool directly talk to the entire user group instead of having gatekeepers? And like, what could we get technology to do for us instead of volunteerism? Because that's a very finite resource that has to be managed. And there's a robot that can do this for me. (laughs) That's the whole reason I'm out of Makerspace, is there's a robot to do it for me. Um, And the FAT project was inspired by the fact that we hit the same bottleneck that a lot of spaces hit, which is the repeatability and the documentation and how do we support it. And what we found was we just aren't going to get there on pure volunteerism and in our little silo. And we brought the project to NomCon 
to get that engagement from the broader community and get the ideas and the perspective and the expertise and then also just get really creative about how to get the pace of development on this closer to you know industry than nonprofit because the nonprofit pace if we keep going at that pace by the time that we finish this like there's gonna be like people will have gills it'll be so far <laughs> down the line evolution like hardware won't even like the hardware we're developing on won't even be well, done anymore like yeah bodies. yeah exactly <laughs> I'm like can't you do that with your implant in your brain now like that's that's about the pace of volunteerism and that's just not going to cut it like every, like by the time we solve a problem it's redundant and and how can we like really accelerate that in a way that doesn't create undue burden on any one person or group um, and then just be broader about how how we knowledge share and use that knowledge together um, and it's been super fun. Um, it's been super stressful <laughs> because I did this project maker style. <laughs> um, uh, if you go to nomcon.foballthethings.org, you can see the dashboard from the con, which is sort of accurate. <laughs> um, but it, it actually shows it. And um, best yet, though, it was the conversations. The whole idea of bringing, you know, a lockbox that you can access with an RFID card to get mints wasn't about distributing mints. It was saying, what? yeah. It wasn't like, about the mints? No, it wasn't about the mints. <laughs> okay, it was a little bit about the mints. I want conference goers to have mints. Um, <laughs> but it, it was about showing, you know, this could be your tool. This could mm -hmm. be your door. This could be, like, this is what an access user experience is like. Mm -hmm. And, like, that we can do this. Like it isn't some magic secret sauce of coding and hardware. Like it truly can be accessible if we want to just do that little bit of effort to make it so. Because mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not a hardware developer. I am not a back end developer. Um, my background is in front end development. But at the end of the day, I'm an executive director who wants data, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm in it for. And I'm stubborn enough to, you know, Bring a project. <laughs> Bring a giant stuffed kraken full of LEDs you control with an RFID card. <laughs> like, and that's that's kind of how it how it happened. And so I'm hoping that, you know, that we work the project as a community this year. I've, you know, I've seen a lot of enthusiasm, and I'm hoping that it sustains itself after the conference. And I'm hoping that next year when we bring it, we level it up even more, and and it's an even more developed conversation. Nice. So. So. If you had one message to send to all the makers out there, what would it be? This is for everyone. Making is for everyone. There's, speaking as somebody who runs a space, who's hanging out with a whole bunch of people who run spaces, I don't do this because people tell me I'm awesome. I don't do this for power tripping. I don't do this because I want it my way. I do this because it, the compelling thing is to make it possible for everybody to make something and be engaged and you know have agency in their world and this is for everybody that's the message awesome yeah well thanks for taking the time to speak with me and this has been awesome so thanks <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> So uh, thanks for taking the time to you know meet with me and talk about you know Indiana makerspaces. So uh, uh, give me a second and uh, tell me about yourself, you know who you are and where you're from. Uh, Nan Braun, and we're based in Kokomo, Indiana. Our home makerspace is Shack Makerspace, and the organization we're here representing is Indiana Makers. Uh, Dave Braun, uh, the other half of the equation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what what brings you guys to NomCon? Uh, well, we're the state delegates for Indiana. So being here is part of the role. Um, I'm also on the program committee, and I'm the lead for the uh, impact metrics working group. So lots of fingers in the workings of things that are happening. Plus, it's my peeps, so you got to <laughs> hang out. Right, yeah. What's been your favorite part of NomCon so far? The magic wheelchair reveal. That that's, brings it all together, why we make stuff. Yeah, yeah that was really exciting to watch. Just those little things. Every time we touch someone like that, we make things better. What about you, Nan? Um, 
I liked the social justice sewing academy this morning. Again, right? It's that impact of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's just been, for me, it's like it's like coming back home. You know, that first moment you walk in and people see you and you get hugs and like the people that the people that support us all year long, remotely and digitally, and that we have continuing ongoing conversations with to be, to be just face to face and person to person for an entire weekend is rejuvenating for me. So you mentioned that you're part of an overarching organization that helps all the Indiana Makers spaces. Can you tell me more about that? Sure. So Indiana Makers is a nonprofit organization of its own accord. And our mission is to advocate for makers in the state of Indiana and the surrounding areas. And we also provide supports to lower the barrier for entry. So um, consulting and helping new maker spaces get up and running and organized, as well as trying to support other maker spaces through transitions in their life cycle. Our, our goal is to make sure that more maker spaces grow in Indiana and the ones that are there have stability and continu- can continue to thrive. And connect them. Yes, so connect them together. Things like share, you know, our home maker space took advantage of that. We traded a kitchen sink for a 3D printer, <laughs> right? So no by connecting them, we can move resources across the state um, or opportunities or collaboration for like grants and information that you know everybody's running their maker space and they're bearing down running it, but they don't always are aware of what's going on. Knowledge, Knowledge. so people who need instructors can share knowledge across things just you know anything that helps everybody get better are the collaborations we want to see happen yeah it's just that's definitely something that we try to focus on at river sea labs is we we believe every makerspace should support the other makerspaces Um, we have one that's maybe about 10 15 minutes away from us and we kind of help them every now and then Um, we've got some connections with you know pumping station one and um, stuff like that in chicago but yeah that's awesome there's like you have an actual nonprofit that focuses on taking care of everything in Indiana it's really cool sort of the dream I have is if you're if you're from a state that has like an art commission right usually the state will put money into the art commission and the art commission then moves the money to the local artist groups via grants and stuff like that because it's easier for uh, the state to work with just one entity that gets and then one message and 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 so forth trying to consolidate that to make it easier to work with the state that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, I mean, is there anything else you guys want to talk about? That's kind of out of... I, I lo- I, I, Chattanooga is awesome. Right? So, yes, actually. So, we're actually... Um, Indiana Makers is partnering up with the Black Sheep Organization, which is a group of sort of rebel creatives who are trying to um, work social change and social justice and um, we're going to be promoting a make for justice hashtag and we'll be publishing in July a list of different um, of the UN uh, sustainable development goals and giving everybody a common goal to focus on in a place where people can upload stories and pictures of what they're working on so the next quarter is gender equity as a topic, right? And whether you're working on an actual maker project to do something or you're doing an art show or you're just giving a talk or whatever it is, giving everybody kind of a coalescence so that no matter where people turn, they have artists and makers and educators and all kinds of people talking about the same thing at the same time to really kind of raise awareness for those sustainable development goals. So watch for that coming out next quarter. So if they wanted to keep tabs on that, where would they go to keep up with that um give me a week to finish the website but it will be <laughs> it will be makeforjustice.com we have the url awesome so uh, to wrap up if you had one message to give out send out to all the makers out there what would it be have fun making like you can't can't lose your own personal joy in it if you're doing all the work you still got to take time to just have some fun making you yeah. <laughs> I have a tagline for the year. Go. <laughs> Stop bitching and start building. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, that works. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys for, uh, you know, taking the time to meet with me and share your story. Absolutely. Yeah, so first off, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. You're, like, the busiest person here. So oh, you're so I really <laughs> appreciate that. So uh, tell us, uh, you know, who you are, where you're from, 
a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Dorothy Jones Davis. I'm the executive director of Nation of Makers. Um, I am uh, living currently in Silver Spring, Maryland. I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, and I don't know, what else do you want to know? I mean, uh, you know, what do you, what do? You do? So um, just in my day to day or just like, well, like I mean, why are we here? Why are we here? OK, yeah. OK, OK. So I made this thing. Usually people are like, oh, what do you make? And I was I don't get a chance to make stuff that much uh, anymore, although I have a 10 year old daughter. Um, and so a lot of my making now is really mostly with her teaching her different things. Um, uh, and just you know sharing in her own process of how she's learning about making um, she has like a multiple multiple businesses so she actually probably teaches me more things than uh, than, than I teach her um, but I also uh, you know making uh, an organization in a way so uh, Again, I'm the executive director of Nation of Makers, and we're a national nonprofit that supports the maker community. Um, so all different types of maker organizations, whether they're spaces or event organizers or events that happen, or um, other organizations that support the maker movement. And one of the things that we make every year is this um, annual conference of maker leaders called NomCon. Um, so the Nation of Makers Conference, and uh, we bring together leaders from uh, all around the country and we even have some from Canada and Mexico wow, yeah. um, that attend usually and we have this you know conference where we, we bring together people to talk about um, successes to talk about pain points and really to to address how are we going to go forward as a community um, so this year's conference is uh, titled the power of the network that's our, our theme and really we're um, hammering hard on how we do things better together and really encouraging that connectivity between organizations and across um, different sectors um, so that we can have more impact on their communities around us and then really talking about how do we share that out so we have a few sessions around um, metrics of impact and what does do those metrics look like whether it's uh, quantitative data or qualitative data um, and just how do we share our stories and the impacts that we're having on our community so we can continue to get things like funding and resources to continue to grow and thrive. Uh, so this is the second year you've done yeah, NomCon. Yeah. So how do you feel like this year is going compared to last year's? So we had a few. <laughs> <laughs> you attended. No, we had a few uh, interesting events happen that were un out of our control. Um, but I've been in all honesty, in terms of the conference and the content itself, um, I think we're growing. And and what I mean is, um, when I was looking at the numbers, we're roughly we're about a hundred people less. Although I haven't seen the final numbers. There's a lot of people that registered on site. So I think we're probably about equivalent. We might be a few people under what our our numbers were last year in terms of attendees. But I think. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from a lot of people at the conference, and um, we have a lot of new people, which is really exciting. So to me, that shows growth. And um, you know, a number of people that came last year couldn't come for structural reasons. So I think we have a lot of returning people, but you know, some of the other returning people that might have come, you know, just couldn't for different reasons. But I think beyond that, you know, people that I've talked to, whether they're new or had attended last year, they're all like, you know, I'm learning really valuable things. I feel like this has been transformative um, for the people that came last year they really feel like the conversations have made it to the next level, which is really what we're trying to do. So, you know, um, you know, we're certainly here to support people that might be starting out, that might have very, very basic questions, but really we set up NomCon as a way for um, the community to come together and really ask sort of, you know, a little bit more questions around our whole existence as a community. So things that we couldn't answer on our own or maybe find resources for just online, like we need to come together to have those discussions. Um, and so really we, we look towards this convening as an opportunity for people to get together certainly and give each other hugs and be excited to see one another, but more than that, really to, to be forward thinking and agenda set. And I think we've done that. Like this year we've really gotten to a place where we're having some of these deeper conversations. Like, you know, what, is, what does event production look like for the maker community? in a world where you know things are changing you know what does sustainability for our entire movement look like or particular organizations look like how do we answer some of these larger questions that maybe may, many of us are are looking at like open you know like access controls or open source you know resources that people have been working on in their own silos mm -hmm. and it's not until you come together to you're like oh wait I was doing that and I have a different piece than you do and oh if we work together we can we can actually get this done and so I think that those synergy points I mean it, it brings me great joy I'm a connector by like sort of nature mm -hmm. so like when I see those conversations happening and every door I open or look 
into. It's like I keep seeing those ahas and people keep grabbing me. Oh my God, I met the most amazing person and we're going to do this amazing thing. That's really what this is about is, you know, that spirit of um, creation um, at sort of the macro level. So, yeah. you know, we all create things, but now we're creating a movement and, and right. that's really like really awesome to continue yeah. to watch and growing it. I mean, obviously the movement's been here, but, you know, nurturing and growing it and then having people, you know, we have Dale here, we have Sherry Lassiter, mm -hmm. you know, we have people that are, you know, very preeminent people within our community who are also here as part of the dialogue. So it's not, you know, like, oh, this is something different. This is just, you know, our community and how we're continuing to grow and expand and have those really important dialogues. It's very exciting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what's been your favorite part of the conference this year? So as you can imagine, I don't get to like actually spend a lot of time in the sessions. Um, right. Unfortunately, I usually do a lot of my debriefing, either watching things that we've recorded or, you know, talking individually to people or just, you know, reading the notes from the different sessions. So um, most of the sessions I've attended are the keynotes. Um, I do think all of our keynotes have been spectacular. We really worked hard to create some really dynamic conversations. Um, we had this mayor's town hall, which was a first time yeah. thing, bringing together um, five mayors from around the country was just really spectacular and they're all in different places and really getting people to not be afraid to talk to a mayor and getting people past this that was one of my favorite moments and then like I said those conversations I mean I've just been hearing such as I walk by somebody who I thought knew somebody else finally like meeting for the first time and, and coming up with a great idea and sort of seeing how that goes forward that's always like those those are like my special moments where it's like without this those people would have not gotten together right and I, you know, I think we have the opportunity to do something really, really special that you know catap catapults and catalyzes the whole entire movement. So, right. yeah. So, if you had one message you want to send out to all the makers out there, what would it be? Ooh, that's a hard question. Um, I think it's like don't be afraid to you know step out of your silo. Um, you know, I think that um, the the you know making. So we have the thing called the maker movement, right? And you know, it's it's maker until you kind of move, right? So it, like you, you look, at, look, look at that, it's kind of cheesy to say it that way, but I, I sort of do think about it that way. Like, you know, what makes something a movement? Well, it's a group of people that have agreed a community sort of a practice that's deciding to go forward with a message or move forward. And we don't all have to be moving you know, moving forward with the exact same, like, this is our talking point, but we, we are need to be moving forward in the same direction with a bunch of voices that are really diverse to push forward the work that we're doing. And so, you know, I'm happy to have all these individual maker organizations and the maker part of the maker movement. Um, but I think for us to continue to be a movement, to thrive, to grow, we're really going to have to step out of ourselves. And that's really what Nation of Makers is about, is the power that we have together. Um, and so I would just encourage individual makers and maker organizations, you know, we want you to continue making things and being, you know, by yourself and doing your special thing. But we also encourage you to step out past that special thing and say, hey, how can I work with somebody else? How can I work with my community around me? How can I have an impact on someone just besides the little thing that I'm doing? And I think if we're all able to do that, we're just going to, you know, go rocket speed, catalyzing, you know, forward. Um, at least that's my vision. I think that we can definitely do that. And you've, we've seen it over and over again when people decide to use their, their maker power, their maker skill to push things forward. I mean, it's tremendous, the impact we have. Well, thanks for taking the time again yeah, to no speak worries. with me. Thank you, know. you for having me on. It's my, it's my first time here in Amcon. Oh, awesome. It's, it's been so awesome. So how was your experience? Could I ask you that? Like, yeah, like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's been amazing. So. Uh, and what made you come? Like, I mean, how did you hear about uh, So Devin from the Akron Makerspace. Oh, okay, awesome. Uh, yeah. he, he was on, he's been on the show twice now. Oh, okay. And the last episode, he really pushed for me to go because oh, I'm awesome. the president of River City Labs in Peoria, oh, Illinois. Oh, okay, okay. Um, makerspace. Um, so he really pushed me to go. He's like, oh, you know, the value is just, you know, Oh, immeasurable awesome. Awesome. and even just yesterday is the first day like i already have like almost 300 lines of markdown on my laptop for notes from all the oh, sessions I love it. like you know i listened to uh, joel gordon speak yeah. about you know, micro manufacturing and yeah. getting you know makerspaces to that um i met you know uh joel leonard yeah, yeah. talked with him all actually the Joels are good. <laughs> <laughs> i interviewed him this morning uh talking about his stuff but i mean yeah the, the connections, the networking, yeah, the getting people yeah. face to face that yeah. that normally would never be in the same room together. Right, now right. you're sharing those ideas. Or you might pass them. You might pass them in a maker fair, but not really get a chance to have a conversation with them about what they're doing. So I think that that's just so powerful. Yeah. So like I'm also working on an access control system. Oh, awesome. And I ran into Rachel. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, and so I spent a lot of time with her yesterday. I actually helped you know troubleshoot her Python script because oh, it wasn't it wasn't yeah, working. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and you know, now, now I'm going to her session later today um, awesome. because I want to brainstorm those ideas because we're, we're trying to solve the same thing, but she's going the more DIY route and I'm going the more product route, yeah. you know, easy to implement, you know, for mm -hmm. someone who doesn't know how to solder. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've, I've been having a blast. I'm really, I'm definitely coming back next year. Awesome. So. Well, that's I'm, that makes me very happy to hear. So <laughs> thank you for sharing your experience. I appreciate that. Yeah. So thanks for taking the time. No you know, I'll get, get out of your hair. Yeah. No, you're totally awesome. <laughs> thank you. All right. So I'm here with Eric from Patcher.io. Uh, Eric, can you tell me a little bit about uh, Patcher.io and kind of where you guys came from? Yeah, for sure. Um, basically, we provide really intuitive, simple to use PCB software for uh, designing circuit boards for anyone outside of the engineering space and including some and most engineers as well. Um, really trying to make something that you can just pick up and use um, without uh, any time learning it. It takes two, three minutes to onboard. You get in, you can export and uh, manufacture directly with us. Um, but you know, my journey really started, I've been making all my life, uh, my degrees in art, uh, interactive art and wearable technology. Um, I went and I was working for an R&D lab building flame-throwing drones and um, robots and I had smart pants that text you when your zipper was down. Awesome. I'm um, just building really fun stuff. Love it. Um, and realized that there was no, no one had created software that democratized designing hardware. Um, so we went in and said rather than learning software to d design our own hardware, we might as well build the software mm -hmm. like a true maker. Yeah. Um, and we built it and now it's been two years and we launched manufacturing last week and we're super excited. Awesome. So, uh, I guess, tell me a little bit what, what makes Patcher stand out from stuff like KiCad or Easy EDA stuff like, or, uh, Fritzing, like, yeah. like what, what, what stand, what, what makes it stand out from those guys? Yeah. I think one thing that we're really trying to do is cultivate the community around the product. Um, we really care a lot about what people are creating with the software helping them create what they want. Um, and in doing so, everything with Patcher is like, we've thought through every step of the process so that you can get exactly what you want without um, getting mad, getting frustrated or anything. Um, we want it to be like just, we say PCB design should be the easy part of your project. Um, and I think that's our biggest differentiator. We have tutorials, we have um, community content, we're working on uh, pages to really interact with people, bring people together and, and grow together as a community. Awesome. So uh, you have different tiers, you know, for access. Uh, can you explain a bit about those? Yeah, um, our tier system is super simple. Um, we have a free version, uh, which is the entire platform, uh, except for every project that you do is open sourced. Um, and then the uh, premium version is private projects only, uh, and you can do open source projects if you'd like, um, and that's fifteen dollars a month. Um, outside of that, manufacturing is pretty simple. Um, we do a seven-day turn at $4 per square inch, a five-day five day turn at $5 per square inch, and a three-day turn at $8 per square inch. And who, do you, who do you go through for the, the PCB manufacturing? Is that local to the U.S.? Yeah, we have a team in, uh, in L.A. and a team in Silicon Valley. Um, and then we're about to offer assembly as well um, at maker Ooh. prices, which no one's ever done successfully. So we're yeah. really excited for that. So how would that work? Um, yeah, we're thinking another tiered uh, tiered pricing structure. Um, it's going to be, we're trying to get it as simple as possible, make it like $20. Uh, I think it's $20, $40, $60, depending on how many parts you have. Um, and then we'll kit as well. So if you, uh, if you just want the parts at our prices, we'll get those put into the package as well. And then at a discount, we'll uh, surf, uh, do all your surface mount components and all the three hole components we'll put it in the bag and send it your way so that you can finish the board. That's really neat. We're that, really excited. That sounds really cool. I was reading a bit of your terms of service last night, and it mentioned, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, with the free tier, all the projects are open sourced. Mm -hmm. um, but the only licenses I saw were Creative Commons. Yep. Um, do you have options for any other licenses like GPL or stuff like that? Not right now. We, um, we need to go back in and add more licenses. We, uh, we've recognized that like MIT, MIT is a big license. Yes. Like when we first started, it was like, oh, we'll just do Creative Commons, just stick it with that. Um, but yeah, we're gonna definitely expand that out so that people have awesome. a lot more choices. Yeah, because all my stuff, I, I license GPL. Yeah. I love the idea of forcing everybody else to, uh, to release theirs as well, if, yeah. they, if they use mine. Uh, no, I love that too. Yeah. And like, I want to add the beerware license into it. Um, <laughs> I want to do a lot of different stuff. Um, and that's the thing. We're like so excited. We're such a creative team that like, we're just going to kind of 
put that maker culture into our product and do like whatever we want and just make fun, cool uh, stuff, cool features. It was really, really fun. That's awesome. Yeah. So I noticed you had uh, on your table, you have a uh, almost like interlocking circuit boards that are soldered together at the joints forming actual like 3d circuits like mm -hmm. is that something you guys came up with or did you just find that somewhere else or yeah um so uh i think we, you can't really look at hardware this year without seeing 3d uh circuit boards and that's been like this weird movement um that not a lot of people have really gotten into it's been like a select few people um, and we were like, we got to do something fun. And uh, the idea of, yeah, having these like connect thing that come together. Um, we were going to do jigsaws, um, like tacos. And because we're from Austin, Texas, we want to do some fun little things. Um, but then it was like, no, let's create this modular system. And people are like, where can we buy this? It's like, no, it's free. Take it, you know. Yeah, and that stuff is all going to be, again, open source, put on our site. Every, that's the thing. Everything we do is open source, uh, we put a tutorial on it, we post it on Hackster, Hackaday, and Instructables. Um, and then if you don't even want to design it, you just want to download the, uh, the Gerber file, you have that option as well. Awesome. So how do components work? Is there a set list of components? Can I add my own components? Because you know, uh, in any given you know, design, the components you actually source and put on the board will change over time. Mm -hmm. How does that work with Patcher? Yeah, so that's a great question. Components, I think, for any CAD software like ours, it's like, the pitfall of your software. So we have 150, 200 parts right now. Um, we just finished a parser that we use internally. We're, we uh, are taking a lot of the existing parts on GitHub, going through and putting them on. One thing that um, other people have tried to do, but I don't think have done well, is the component verification. All our components are verified with data sheets and uh, with pricing and DigiKey links, everything. Oh, nice. Um, so we want to ensure that like when it goes, if you go to assembly, they don't have to do anything. You know, everything is all, like I said, we take the heartache out of all that. Um, we do have a component creation tool that we built last year that's been in internal QA for a long time because it's really buggy. Um, <laughs> but when that goes out, everyone will be able to add them. Um, we want to give people discounts for adding components. So uh, you'll get like per, per 10 components, we'll give you like a percent off of your premium subscription or a month free or something. Nice, because you're helping build the, exactly. build the platform. Exactly, the community, building the community. Awesome, yeah. that's, that's a really good idea. Yeah, component stuff is great. And uh, that, that brings me to another part of components. We're releasing a new system um, that uh, will have e-commerce in, in it so you can buy directly from us. Um, and then on top of it as well, favorited components, most used components. Um, nice. You can see community components and like people can comment on them and say, hey, don't use this. Or like, this was fantastic, that kind of stuff. We're really, really excited. Awesome. Um, would you be able to speak at all to like, I mean, what, what's, what uh, technology you use in the back end? Like what's it written in, languages, infrastructure? They it's Node, Any idea? I think. Yeah, Node. Node. Yeah, I'm more the idea guy okay. um, and the the PCB design guy. Um, and then, yeah, our architect, he did it all in Node and Bootstrap. Yeah, so. Okay. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm a full stack engineer, so, oh, awesome. so that's, that's why I was curious. And I, I like to bring the software side to our all of our discussions yeah. on the show. But. I mean, we've learned a lot. Uh, we're cloud-based, so we have to deal with everything, you know, trying to figure out. We had a major ed, uh, edge bug uh, last week, and it's, it's crazy designing. You think, oh, it'll be great. It'll be easy. We'll just do cloud. No, it's not. It's, there's so many different things that you have to do. Hey, man, it's it just was, somebody else's computer. You yeah, still got to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think for, I, I got to test it. For a while in our early, early days, it just did not work on Internet Explorer. <laughs> so we had a modal that popped up and was like, hey, please download Chrome. Are you, are you, okay, I was going to no. say, are you actually supporting IE still? Or? Um, I believe you can do it-ish. It's just kind of clunky. Um, but yeah, we, we do support most modern browsers. Yeah, because even Microsoft doesn't call IE a browser anymore. It's, yeah, they, it's a compatibility tool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'd say if you're listening to this and you want to check us out, Chrome is by far the best experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, yeah, if someone wanted to keep tabs with you guys, where should they go to check um, up on it? So theoretically, I'd say Twitter, but our Instagram is definitely our social hub. We post everything on there. Um, I'd say sign up. We have uh, newsletters going out. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's the, uh, Instagram's your spot for announcements and updates. All right.
Yeah. We're working on our PR side and our marketing side. <laughs> gotcha. Ne- ne- never the maker's strong suits. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we got the pink look, though. <laughs> I think that works. Yeah. I was telling, uh, telling the other guy over there this morning that I'm working on an access control system for our makerspace um, that I'm trying to productize. And just last week, I spent like an entire day like going through tutorials learning KiCad. Yeah. And that's like a whole thing, like the the skill, you know, feeling really high. Yeah, it was insane. Just you can get basic stuff out. And when I saw this there today, I'm like, wow, that looks easy. Yeah. And I mean, that's um, one of my favorite things is when people bring up KiCad or Eagle, um, which are both very robust software, um, but they've kind of, it's built for engineers by engineers. And like, we wanted to come through and say, no, like we're going to design it like as if we were a software design company, not an engineering company. Right. Um, so we take cues from other software that's popular in the space um, and try to take those and put it into ours so that um, it's uh, it's just like super intuitive. Copy and paste is the same thing as it is in everywhere, you know, but you go to Eagle and copy and paste is like totally different, mm-hmm. you know, and there's a big roadblock. So we try to make that as just as simple as possible. I like that differentiation. Yeah, you know, KiCad definitely feels like it's definitely professional grade. Mm-hmm. But then it requires a professional to use it. You exactly. know, it take you have to spend the time to learn the tool. Whereas, you know, if I'm just a maker and I just want to make a, a nice development board, yeah, like I don't want to spend a week learning KiCad. Yeah, you and know, we, the future goal is to give you that professional backing. Um, we uh, have a, a partnership with a company out in California that we're working on integrating, um, and it's uh, verification and layout. So oh, you go nice. halfway through. And you're like, I'm stuck. Be like, great, pay us. We haven't even set a price for it. Say 25 <laughs> bucks, and in 24 hours, they'll either finish the board for you or find the problem within your project. Oh, neat. And be like, all right, it's done. And then you can export it however you want. Yeah, that's so awesome. Really excited about that feature as well. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to discuss? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd say, you know, for people listening out there, check us out. Go to hackster.io and check out our uh, our project hub there. We have all our tutorials over there. Um, and, yeah, just keep making, have fun, post stuff. We're always happy. Reach out to us, please. We're always happy to interact with you all um, and have some fun and, uh, yeah, pay people to make stuff. So, mm-hmm. so that's P-A-T-C-H-R dot I-O. Patcher. Patcher. Yeah. Right, yeah. Like every great startup, we drop the E. Yeah. Of course. Grab the I-O domain. Oh, thanks for meeting with me. It's yeah. a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.